Muy buenas tardes. Buenos, buenos días aquí. Buenas tardes, Antonia. Bueno, si queréis podemos ir empezando, ¿vale? Ok, yo creo que está bien, estamos en hora además, ¿no? Sí, bueno, voy a comenzar haciendo una pequeña introducción de David Taylor, ¿vale? Y enseguida le pasaré la palabra, vamos a ir comenzando. En primer lugar, bueno, pues quiero agradecer, bueno, Luis y yo queremos agradecerle a David Taylor que esté aquí con nosotros hoy, para nosotros realmente, bueno, pues es un auténtico placer eh, tenerlo aquí hoy y, bueno, pues queremos agradecerle su participación y el esfuerzo de reunirse a pesar de la diferencia horaria y de toda la situación tan complicada que estamos viviendo, ¿no? con la pandemia. Hubiese sido estupendo poder tenerlo en persona, por supuesto, pero, bueno, pues la situación sanitaria no nos lo permite. En cualquier caso, seguro que todos vamos a disfrutar mucho de su intervención hoy. Él es, eh, para aquellos que no lo conozcáis, es fotógrafo eh, de, y profesor de arte en la Universidad de Arizona. Él imparte clases de fotografía en dicha universidad, donde bueno, pues él desarrolla en paralelo su actividad docente y artística. David Taylor, eh, además, a través de su obra, explora bueno, pues, toda la idea del espacio, el territorio, la historia y la política, sobre todo bueno, pues, a través de la frontera entre Estados Unidos y México. Su trabajo ha sido expuesto en el, tanto a nivel nacional como internacional y es muy importante señalar, además, bueno, pues, su compromiso y su, bueno, toda su eh, bueno, inmersión en proyectos de larga duración que él desarrolla con un gran, una gran labor de investigación, muy concienzuda, con un gran compromiso y con muchísima dedicación. Y en todo ese proceso de creación e investigación, lo que busca es pues, mostrar las circunstancias cambiantes de la zona fronteriza entre Estados Unidos y México, que ha sido básicamente, pues como os comento, el tema eh, sobre el que ha versado todo su trabajo. Eh, quiero destacar también que 2008 fue premiado con una beca Guggenheim, en 2010 publicó eh, uno de sus libros más significativos, Working the Line, eh, por Radios Books, que recibió además numerosos premios al mejor libro y también eh, fue premiado por la excelencia en el diseño. Además, también a raíz de su trabajo en colaboración con otro artista mexicano, eh, Marco Ramírez R., pues realiza un proyecto colaborativo que mostró eh, la Bienal Paisajes eh, Inestables de 2014 en Santa Fe y se publicó eh, también a raíz de, de todo este trabajo un segundo libro que se titula eh, pues Monumentos, 276 vistas de la frontera entre Estados Unidos y México. Una publicación que se hizo además en colaboración fue publicada por Radios Books y además el Museo de Arte de Nevada en 2015. Su obra forma parte, como podéis imaginar, de grandes colecciones, colecciones permanentes de, de muchísimas instituciones como el Museo de Arte de Nevada, el Museo de Arte Nelson Atkins en Kansas City, la Biblioteca del Congreso de Estados Unidos en Washington o el Museo también de Arte de Nuevo México, así como el Museo de Bellas Artes de Houston. Sus proyectos también han tenido pues, una gran difusión a través de distintas publicaciones, eh, The Guardian, The New York Blog, Político, The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Place Journal, Prefix Photo, Fraction Magazine y la edición mexicana latinoamericana de la revista Squire. Sus fotografías han sido expuestas en numerosas instituciones mediante exposiciones tanto individuales como colectivas, como por ejemplo la Universidad de Harvard, el Museo de Fotografía Contemporánea de Columbia College, el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo Aldrich, el Museo de Arte también de Phoenix, el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de San Diego, el Instituto Cultural Mexicano en Washington, D.C., y eh, también el Museo de las Artes de la Universidad de Guadalajara, así como el Museo de Bellas Artes de Houston también. Recientemente, bueno, hace ya eh, un par de años, en 2019, el artista fue premiado con una residencia en el prestigioso proyecto Siqueiros, La Tallera, en, Cuerna, en Cuernavaca, México. Y ese mismo año, además, recibió una beca de investigación de la Comisión de Arizona para las Artes. Así que, bueno, pues esto es un poquito así, a, a grandes rasgos, unas líneas para que conozcáis un poquito más a, a este artista. Yo no quiero detenerme mucho más. Quiero darle la palabra a él, pues no, no quiero robarle más tiempo. 
porque lo que él vaya a decir seguro que es mucho más interesante que lo que yo tenga que contaros ahora mismo. Con lo cual, bueno, pues eh, él nos va a dar hoy una conferencia dentro del, eh, del Máster en Arte, Idea y Producción, eh, titulada, bueno, el borde, límite, frontera, todos estos conceptos, ¿no?, en torno a la frontera, marcando el cambio a través del tiempo, ¿no? Y, bueno, pues, una vez más reitero mi agradecimiento. Eh, David va a dar la conferencia, bueno, mitad entre el inglés y el español. Él entiende bastante bien el español y también eh, se comunica bien en español, pero va a estar mezclando, ¿vale? Así que espero que todos, bueno, podáis seguir bien la, la conferencia, ¿vale? David. Hola, buen día, Hola. buen día a todos. You can gracias, start. Por, Thank you. gracias por invitarme. Um, uh, es um, uh, un gran uh, honor um, um, y mucho gusto uh, conocerlos. Un placer. Um, uh, Perdón, uh, porque mi español es malo, um, uh, uh, puedo tardar a uh, uh, um, uh, hablar en español, pero um, creo que necesito cambio entre español e inglés. Um, lo siento. Okay. Um, uh, mi obra es... Uh, mi obra es sobre um, uh, el espacio um, de la frontera entre los Estados Unidos y México y um, cómo el espacio cambió um, uh, over time, uh, um, con tiempo. Um, y ahora... Um, uh, hay mucho cambio en la frontera ahora mismo. Um, es un espacio muy, muy difícil um, porque la policía de los Estados Unidos, de, um, uh, el, del gobierno y um, uh, con Donald Trump, uh, uh, hay um, uh, mucha construcción en la frontera. Um, Uh, hay muchos problemas para uh, uh, los refugiados. Um, uh, um, uh, that arrive at the border. Um, I, uh, uh, que um, uh, llegan a la frontera. Um, uh, porque la policía de los Estados Unidos cambió mucho. Um, así que... Um, Uh, uh, mi obra en gran parte es de la frontera um, uh, físicamente uh, y um, uh, um, uh, los cambios um, uh, en uh, for the last 20 years para, para, um, uh, uh, 20 años pasado. ¿Está bien? ¿Está bien? Creo que habría escrito eso. Sorry, lo siento. Uh, so, let's see, where to go from there. Um, ahora, uh, creo que la frontera es más que un espacio físicamente. Uh, es un lugar que. Um, tra it, it, uh, transmitar? Tra uh, it, it, it's a space, you might need to help me with this, um, Antonia, por favor. Um, the border is a space that is transmitting information to us. We're, we're receiving, we can think about it as a space much larger than, than um, uh, frontera inmediatamente. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a space that tells us about um, location far removed from the immediate border at this point because so many things converge in that space. Is everybody hearing me? I hope I'm not just talking to myself. <laughs> 
Sí, oh, bueno. Ok. Uh, pues, uh, sí. <ríe> muy bien. Um, uh, uh, ¿Puede entender? ¿Puede, ¿Pueden entender? Makes what I'm saying. Sí. Ok, muy bien. Gracias. Um, uh, Ok, uh, con la introducción um, uh, puedo comenzar con uh, un kino. Um, uh, uh, necesito comp compartir mi uh, my screen. Uh, un momentito. Um, share my screen. Tengo, tengo lengua practicar, pero un discurso en español es... Es, uh, es la primera vez para mí. Uh, uh, let's see. Our screen share. And now. Uh, okay. I have, um, tengo um, uh, tres o, uh, no, tengo cinco slides uh, para compartir y después um, uh, tengo un link para un video um, uh, um, que puedo um, enviarlos, um, enviarles. Um, uh, porque es un video 4K y creo que es mejor um, if you play it on your own machine, on, on tu computador, uh, on su computadoras uh, um, uh, personales. Um, uh, andale. Um, um, un... Let's see, how do I say this? Um, una pregunta um, uh, de, uh, uh, en mi obra ahora es um, cómo la frontera es, um, uh, uh, it's this extended space. It's this extended space that you can um, think about beyond the immediate geography of the border. So um, un, un espacio más grande que Um, la geografía uh, inmediatamente de la frontera. Aquí um, uh, es una foto de um, Talapa, de, uh, no, Talapa um, uh, el Tejote um, en la sierra, um, la sierra um, uh, uh, de Guerrero, um, el estado de Guerrero en, en, en México. Y es un... Um, uh, es un campo um, uh, uh, very remote. It's a very, very remote uh, campo um, in, the, in the Sierra, um, uh, donde los campesinos cultivar uh, amapola, amapola uh, para heroína. Um, y um, el año pasado, um, uh, um, uh, Uh, aquí, uh, para mis investigaciones y um, uh, uh, porque um, quiero ver uh, las conexiones entre la economía pequeña de, uh, de la sierra, um, de um, uh, 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 de los uh, drogas y uh, la economía uh, grande, la economía um, uh, global. Uh, so, the, so, the, um, so, this is the, so this is the campo of um, El, El Tejote um, in the Sierra. Um, and um, it's a very, very remote campo, um, an exceptionally remote campo. Uh, and it's a place where This part of the Sierra and Guerrero is where uh, two thirds of the heroin that, that leaves Mexico comes from. Um, and here's an image uh, of one of the campos interplanted with corn. Um, so you have you have both opium poppy and um, 
uh, corn being grown, milpa. Uh, so I'm interested in drawing a connection between this space and this space, which is, this is the border, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, port of entry in San Ysidro, California, on the day that it was closed when Honduran migrants, refugiados de um, uh, Honduras, uh, attempted to um, gain access to the port to have asylum hearings. Um, and the port was shut down for several hours. Um, and this is what um, the sort of immediate fortifications of the port look like. Um, and um, this is a scene as people were trying to um, gain access to the port um, when they were turned back by police. Um, and then at the same time, I'm documenting detention centers that are located throughout the United States, but uh, there's a high concentration of them uh, in the Southwest borderlands. So, so I, I'm interested in drawing um, a set of connections between these spaces and um, these spaces and thinking about the way the border extends um, uh, well beyond, as I said before, its immediate geography. Um, the work that I've done with these, um, these detention centers has actually become uh, sort of a primary pursuit for me at this point. I, I'm continuing to work with the imagery that I made in Guerrero uh, and the imagery I made uh, during the border closure when the Honduran migrants were turned back um, from the border, which that, that situation persists. The border is effectively closed to refugees and asylum seekers right now. Uh, so I will continue to work with that imagery, but the, the situation in the prisons, especially with the pandemic became highly acute and I decided to devote the majority of my energy to that. So this is sort of what I've been doing for the last two years is sort of working in these three arenas. The article that, um, Antonia, um, sent you all is a, is a, an essay that deals with exactly these three um, these three spaces and sort of breaks it into a set of chapters and, and creates a kind of narrative that threads all of those all of those three arenas together into a coherent a coherent um, uh, sort of thought piece um, a long form essay. Um, these are this image is a triptych of the deten of actual detention cells uh, that are used in the construction of the La Palma detention center. Um, uh, un, un carcere privada um, uh, de Eloy, Arizona, cerca, muy cerca um, uh, de aquí, um, 40 millas um, uh, uh, to the northwest of me. Um, so what I want to do at this point um, having sort of shared with you the idea that that this this work on the detention centers is my primary preoccupation right now, um, I want to share a video with you, um, and so we can all sort of watch it together. It it lasts um, it lasts 15 minutes, a um, little bit under 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat. It's a it's a private link that you can all access it from, um, and you should be able to play it on your on your computer. So here is the link, um, and uh, you probably want to make it has sound, so you're going to want to make sure you have your sound up, um, and probably good to put it into full screen. And I'll play it on my end, and I'm, I'll turn probably turn our sound off um, for the moment while the video plays because um, the uh, you know it'll just echo through all of our different machines. So here's the link. Um, Uh, oh, I gotta put, did I put it in the wrong place? Oh yeah, I'm searching, ah, sorry. Where the heck is the chat window? I'm missing it. All right, uh, everyone, there we go, sorry, my bad. I'm new to the this particular chat platform. Ok, y el vídeo es para visualizarlo ahora, vale? Él prefiere que lo veamos cada uno en nuestro ordenador para que no pierda calidad. 
lo visualizamos y seguimos. Y mi experiencia en Iloy, oh my God. Yo estuve exactamente 22 meses en Iloy. I was in detention for five and a half months. Lo que viví en La Palma, ocho meses de tortura psicológica. Un infierno viviendo seis meses preso. Pero hay personas que llevan un año, diez meses, un año y medio, dos años. Eso es un, es un maltrato. And then I was a year and ice. I was like for two months in Illinois, and then we got transferred to a, um, a Delanto. Pienso que es una de las detenciones más difíciles en La Palma. Estuve por diez meses y veintitrés días. Es muy difícil. De tortura psicológica. La comida es muy mala. La comida al principio, uh, antes de que comenzara lo de, la, lo de la pandemia, era todos los días papa, 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 papa con esto, papa con lo otro. Come la comida es a las 4 de la mañana o a las 5, después a las 10 de la mañana. Después a las cuatro de la tarde ya no come más nada hasta otro día. Se pasa un hambre terrible. Mucha gente nada más va, ve la comida y prefiere quedarse sin comer que comérsela. Eso está muy feo. Cuando empezó la pandemia, en el tanque de nosotros, donde estuvimos encerrados, nos estuvieron un mes. Un mes comiendo almuerzo, comida y cena. Nos daban... Uh, dos piezas de pan, una pieza de jamón, a veces acompañado de una manzana o unas galletas. Asquerosa que la gente lloraba porque no se lo podían comer. Todo duro, el pan ácido, echaba a perder, el jamón verde, el asqueroso, todo era una asquerosidad. Así tuvimos tres meses, comiendo pan con jamón, y las tres veces al día. Hasta que ya la, la prisión entera pues empezó a manifestarse, empezaron a hacer huelga de hambre en el tanque, eh, venían la, los corecicles amenazándonos, que nos iban a echar gas de lagrimonio, amenazando con llevarnos a la celda de castigo. Comenzaron las personas a salir enfermos, enfermos con, con el COVID-19. Entonces eh, se lo llevaban para la celda, para, la misma, para el mismo hoyo, donde ponen a los castigados, ahí mismo empezaron a llevar a los enfermos. Pero que okay, la gente empezó a coger miedo con aislarse porque el trato era inhumano. Um, 
algunos oficiales hispanos son muy groseros con uno, a pesar de que son hispanos. Los oficiales, pues, desgraciadamente, hablando así sinceramente, súper racistas, tanto los encargados de nosotros como los oficiales de deportación, uh, los oficiales de ICE, los, los que trabajaban ahí, uh, que nos custodiaban todo el tiempo gritándonos, exigiéndonos, humillándonos. Los guardias son súper racistas. Hay como dos o dos, tres que son buenas personas y te tratan de hacer tu estancia lo mejor, mejor posible. Pero muchos son racistas. If they say it's locked down, if they say don't do this, if they say don't go, you have to follow their laws. If you break the laws, you will be punished. Es muy dura. Super dura. La atención médica solo te recomiendan agua. Para todo, toma agua, agua. No hay doctores, hay muy poco servicio médico. Yo fui contagiado del COVID-19 en, en esa instalación. Primeramente pusieron en, en cuarentena al tanque completo. Ese tanque. Es de 64 personas, de una litera, una litera arriba y una abajo. Las duchas, no hay ninguna posibilidad de tener el distanciamiento social en ese lugar. Es otra cosa que, que afectaba mucho era de que cada quien ya sabía de que estaba allí la enfermedad y no había las medidas higiénicas. Lo que podíamos hacer era meternos al cuarto y no salir. Fueron cuatro meses trancados en cuarentena sin poder salir, sin poder casi ejercitarme, nada. Pasamos tiempo que ya estaba la enfermedad allí y no nos dieron el tapaboca hasta creo que una semana después llegaron exigiendo de que teníamos que firmar un documento como que el core CIDE evadía de cualquier responsabilidad de que nos pasara a nosotros allí. Ahí, en ese, en ese tiempo que estuve ahí, hubo muchas personas. Nos plantamos para que nos atendieran. Hubo compañeros que colapsaron adentro, adentro del tanque. Personas que se convulsionaban. Y, y rogamos porque nos, nos atendieran los enfermeros. Iban los enfermeros y nos decían, no tienen nada. Es una simple gripa, no pasa nada. Eso es en realidad lo que pasa en la Palma Corrección Centro. Están laqueadas, están, solamente las dejan salir 10 minutos. En esos 10 minutos solamente o decides ir a hacer algo de comer al microwave, bañarte o hacer una llamada. Te lo digo porque mi compañera, ella está detenida y está contagiada de COVID y tiene, es diabética y no han hecho nada con ella. Ella sigue detenida. There was another girl from Africa. She got a news that uh, her son got killed. So, you know, like, because she was crying in order to control it, they isolated it, too. Un cubano una, en una ocasión escaló, no para escapar, sino para colgarse de las púas. 
se quedó colgado de las púas. A uno, a mero arriba, aún así eran los oficiales, lo golpearon, lo gasearon y lo, se lo llevaron. Ahí un amigo mío cubano se cortó las venas. Eh, se han ahorcado ahí la gente se, se vuelve loco, te vuelve loco. Como yo, hay muchas personas, la verdad, es una injusticia lo que hacen ahí. Hay personas que tienen tres años, tres años encerrados ahí. Sí, sí, sí. Hay personas que, que están deportados ellos mismos sin ir a corte. Ya han pedido deportación para su país porque ya no, no soportan más estar dentro de la prisión. Y ya es mejor deportarse para su país en la violencia de su país que seguir eh, tiempo detenido por gusto porque es preso. Many memories used to come in my head. Why don't you go back and die? You understand? If the judge denies you, just tell them, let them take you back home. Since you'll be home, they will kill you at home. De tortura psicológica. Es muy difícil. Um, so, so the video will be a part of a much larger installation, uh, um, un parte de, de un instalación más grande. Um, and, uh, y el proyecto es un, un mapeo, a survey, um, of the industry, so it's the, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the industry, la industria privada, uh, de los cárceles, um, uh, uh, en los Estados Unidos para inmigrantes y asilos y refugiados. Um, uh, so the, the, the real central premise to the project is thinking about the fact that we've created this landscape of incarceration, this this um, this enormous landscape of incarceration, and it is a for-profit system um, uh, in which corporations um, uh, build wealth um, for their shareholders, um, and in which the primary commodity um, is is displaced bodies. So we've commodified human displacement in this system. Um, and you can see that play out um, in the way we're treating the border as well. Um, that the border, um, the border has become um, this site of 
uh, corporate and industrial intervention um, uh, to police that space. Um, and so ultimately what happens is um, the most vulnerable among us become um, uh, a raw material for that, indus for that industry. Um, and so, so I wanted us, I wanted to create a piece of work that gives a sense of the breadth and the scope of that, of that landscape. Um, so the, the video functions as a centerpiece to the project and, and populates, um, the image of this industrial landscape with the voices of people who are, who are detained. So I wanted to sort of reduce the mediation as much as possible. So you actually hear from people who are in um, those spaces. And then um, alongside the video work, I'll be producing um, a portfolio of images, um, which I'm gonna share um, a, a group of the images with you right now. I'll just sort of move through them fairly quickly. So this is a broad survey of um, prisons, large and small, um, that are um, throughout the United States. So this is that this is Eloy, Arizona, uh, Eden, Texas. Um, this is Eloy, Arizona again. Um, uh, it's a different detention center. In Arizona, we have a, a, a lot of detention centers. We have uh, uh, three major detention centers. Um, uh, that are quite large, that are devoted to the incarceration of migrants and refugees. Um, here you can see other views of Eloy. Um, this is La Palma that you were just looking at in the video. Um, the, this is the Florence Detention Center, Florence, Arizona, which is only a half an hour drive from the Eloy location. Um, this is uh, uh, Eden. Um, San Luis in Arizona, um, not far from the Colorado River. Um, this is the Rolling Plains Detention Center in Texas. Um, uh, Sierra Blanca in Texas. Otero Mesa in New Mexico. Uh, Imperial Valley in uh, near Calexico, California. And you can actually see in the distance, um, the line in the distance where the, where the fields end and where the lights, the city begin, that's the border, that's the international border. So that's, so this is like within view of the US-Mexico border. Um, this is um, Nevada, um, Parup, Nevada. Um, uh, this is um, uh, Victorville, California near Victorville, actually. This is the Adelanto Detention Center. Um, again, Nevada. And some of these are both uh, county jails, which house other kinds of um, uh, inmates, and some are, are totally devoted to um, migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Um, this is the Rio Grande Detention Center. Right, you can see here, that's the Rio Grande. So I mean, literally is within view of Mexico. Um, uh, Don Hutto, um, also in, these are in Laredo, Texas, both of the, the, the last one that we looked at and this one as well. Um, this is uh, La Villa, Texas. And so I decided to photograph these with a drone um, in part because it's very hard to be able to see them. You can't, they're not, they're not visually accessible. Um, they're, they're out of the way, they're hidden from view. Um, so the, uh, a drone um, within legal limits um, became the best way to photograph these and to create some sort of a, an accounting of um, the extent of, of, of these facilities. Um, this is one of the largest. This is the South Texas Family Detention Center, um, and it's you know it's this little city that was constructed. M much of um, much of this was actually quite recently constructed in the in the at the very end of the Obama administration, um, and it was specifically to house um, children and uh, and and uh, unaccompanied children, and then also. Um, uh, children with uh, single women who were showing up at the Rio Grande. And so it's, you know, it looks like a tent city. Um, this is uh, the um, 
uh, Coastal Bend Detention Center um, in Robstown, Texas. Um, there's another fa uh, family detention center. Um, and so, you know, they have a kind of sameness to them and it's the accumulation that I'm interested in, right? Like how, you know, how much, how much territory do these things occupy? Sort of what's the, what's the kind of grand sweep of them look like? So the idea of these is that, you know, the individual photos I think have a lot of interesting detail, but I think it's, a, it's really about the accumulation um, and sort of what it speaks to as a, as a group in ag aggregate about, about the fact that we have this industrial um, complex devoted to locking people up, locking people up who actually are not really guilty of any other crime other than attempting to try to find refuge outside of their own country. Um, And then um, there's a set of disused, um, uh, well, somewhat disused uh, detention cells. Uh, you saw the triptych earlier in the presentation um, that are used for training purposes and they're littered with um, uh, smoke grenades um, and tear gas grenades. Um, I actually, uh, I've collected a few of these. Um, and so they use them for training purposes. And I, and I find it interesting that it's, it's yet another kind of commodity, right? That the cells themselves are, are built like you can see, you can see this view of them here. They're little building blocks. So you stack these, you stack these concrete structures up and you have a prison. Um, and so the, the, the sort of commodity aspect of this keeps on repeating itself. Um, uh, you see it play out in multiple different multiple different ways and i was interested how the how the sort of you know the, the irreducible unit um of the of the prefabricated detention cell sort of had a resonance with um all of this um litter from training for crowd control um inmate control um detainee control was strewn all out uh, all throughout inside these spaces so you find these grenades these um, uh, chemical dispersant grenades uh, littered th throughout these these structures, um, and that uh, that was sort of you know just more evidence of the kind of industrial scale of this and the sort of degree to which it's turned into its own enterprise, sort of a freestanding enterprise. It's not it's not um, uh, it's not something that's sort of contingent any longer or um, uh, provisional. It's it's literally the, uh, a sort of economy that free stand that's freestanding on its own, in which there's a dependable supply um, of raw material for um, uh, for the to perpetuate the the business enterprise. And that, to me, you know, is is a really it's it's a, it's probably the most sort of grotesque distortion um, of the manifestation of the border on our side. Um, of the line, and it's really sort of an equivalent to the criminal enterprises in Mexico um, that um, prey upon people's vulnerability and convince people that there's jobs waiting for them and it'll be easy to get across the border, right? So, so guiding people to the border and convincing them that they can get across the border as an industry um, uh, amongst the cartels um, that that has a kind of um, uh, a really disturbing resonance to to what we see here with the the sort of um, uh, compartmentalization and the sort of monetization of people once they get across the border. Um, so so having sort of shown that and sort of laid these ideas out, um, I want to show you um, uh, some of my monuments project, which which Antonia mentioned. Um, so and this really I'm, I'm going to backfill a bit here because it'll t it'll tell you something about how I got to this place. Um, I, I come to the border as an outsider. I grew up in the northeast of the United States. So I'm uh, I'm, uh, you know, not of this place, even though I call it home now. Um, so my point of entry is always something that I'm very careful about. I think that it's um, it, in particular um, critical that one not. Um, sort of colonized subject matter. And so I try to deal with my relationship to the US border in a very um, uh, mindful way. And I think a great deal about what, what can I do um, as an artist based on my background that maybe somebody else can't, 
what's the benefit of being an outsider? What does that, what does that afford me? Um, what kind of access does it afford me? Um, what side of, sort of um, uh, ability to sort of transit a space unnoticed does it afford me? And so, so that's kind of always my, you know, my, my basic modus operandi in, in the way I conduct myself. So I, I um, learned about the monuments that mark the United States-Mexico border while I was living in Las Cruces, New Mexico, um, and, uh, and was fascinated by the idea that the only um, uh, uh, designation of the division between the two countries for you know, the better part of a century was these obelisks. Um, and they literally have a legal demarcation of the border. So one half of the obelisk is in Mexico and the other half is in the United States. Um, and, and so they, they are effectively the visual, you know, the visual indicator of the border. Um, and so this is, a, this is a historic photograph that was made in the 1890s by a man named D.R. Payne um, on, on glass plate. Um, and then this is my contemporary photograph of that same obelisk. Um, and so, so I set out to photograph every single one of these obelisks. There's 276 of them. So, 276 uh, entre uh, El Paso, Texas y um, Tijuana, um, Baja California. Um, and and I wanted to I wanted to make a picture picture of all of them. Uh, I I I, um, I wanted to to document every single one. And as a result, um, I sort of generated. Um, uh, I have a map of the, of 690 miles of border in my head. Um, and and I and and the what happens is this work it becomes a survey that shows um, uh, change over time. Uh, because as I make the photographs, um, the border is changing constantly in the decade, in, in, in the, you know, the, the several years that it took me to get to all of these, all of these obelisks. Um, and so you begin to see the residue of the, um, the Secure Fence Act um, and, the and, the, and the sort of ever increasing desire to um, seal the border and make it less and less permeable. And the, the obelisks are in, in very remote areas, but also in um, uh, very populous areas. So we're roughly moving west as we, as, you know, the selection I've chosen, we're kind of moving west um, as we see these heading toward the Pacific Ocean. And you see more and more wall um, as we head further west, in part because more and more of it was being constructed, but also it tend, there's more sort of densely populated urban areas in the west, and so you tend to see more of it there as well. But like in this picture, you know, this is this is definitely the newer the newer barriers, the the um, steel bollards with the plate steel um, uh, valance at the top to you know really try to stop people from crossing. And so here we're in Campo, California. And I, I as, a, as an artist, um, you know, I thought it was really important for me to have, I, I tend to feel as though to, to be, uh, what's the right way to say? I, for, for me, a, a sort of immediacy of experience is very important. I, I, in, in, a, in a glib way or a, or a sort of offhanded way, I say that, um, I'm a junkie for unmediated experience. I really, I think it's very important to be close to the subject. I'm not, um, I don't work remotely. I work in situ um, and, and that immediacy is really important to me. 
Um, and so all of these photographs, I mean, just by, just based on practicality, many of these photographs are made um, in Mexico. So you can't, this monument isn't accessible from the United States. So I'm, I'm constantly on, on either side of the border in this work. And in many cases, when the monuments are located in remote areas, um, I'm crossing the border in those remote areas. So there's a, there's a lot of negotiating the space of the boundary um, in various ways that, that manifests in this work. Um, and I think that that really increases my sort of knowledge and under you know understanding of the space in in critical ways. So I I think about this work as um, endurance practice. So it's there's a kind of a performative aspect to it, and that you know you you have a kind of visual um, uh, record of where I've been, um, and it's intensive. I had to travel every single one of those 690 miles and find every single one of the 276 obelisks, which was a feat at times. Um, it's endurance practice, it's serial imagery, right? You understand um, the images in relation to one another. So maybe, you know, it becomes a kind of template for the, the prison work. Um, it's also um, typology, um, very similar to what um, uh, the, Be the Beckers do, um, but in, in different than what the Beckers do, um, where they photograph water towers or blast furnaces, things like that. Um, it's distinctive in that um, in, in, in the Becker's work, the, the, the sort of emergent form that you see in the Becker's work has to do with the variation within the, the type, right? So you look at water towers and there's all these different variations on, on what, that, what that structure might look like in different contexts. Whereas here, I mean, with, with some exception, there's a few different types of monuments because of when they were installed, but by and large, they're either, the, they're either 11 foot masonry monuments or six foot cast iron monuments and so um, in the case of in the case of this work it functions as typology not because of the form of the of the monument but because of the context right the variation in the context is where the emergent meaning is right what are these things surrounded by what are their circumstances um, and so so i wanted this to be a kind of dispassionate map of the border that really gives you know, provides a, a, a very um, specific kind of snapshot of what, what the border is at this particular moment in time when I do this work. And many of these photographs can't be made in the same way now. That, that the, the border has, like this spot has radically changed. Um, and so it, do, it just doesn't look, it doesn't look the way it does here. Um, so then um, out the, the monument work actually grew, sort of was parallel with another body of work I did which speaks to maybe the, the, the work of photographing the Honduran migrants as they're attempting to cross the border. Um, this is a project called Working the Line. Um, and in that, I, I, I literally did this work parallel to getting to the monuments um, where I would in, intersect with border patrol, um, uh, with uh, um, narco traficantes, with um, immigrants, um, and I, I made photographs of them um, as I was commencing with that other work. And, and it gives a kind of view into, again, how the border is changing. So I have, you know, the, the, the border wall being constructed. Um, I have uh, the, the, you know, the finished border wall. And pay, I'm paying attention to those, you know, to those spaces in a really um, uh, concerted way. Um, and I spent time in border patrol stations um, and and saw the you know the the, the way that um, those people who had been apprehended at the border were treated and processed this again is is at a very kind of critical moment because the border um, the way the border is being forced enforced changes at this time um, so we go from um, what's sort of um, uh, in political parlance, it's called catch and release, and we hear that term in the United States in the media a lot. In legal terms, what the Border for, uh, Patrol referred to it as, it was voluntary return. Um, so people would get apprehended, they'd get caught, apprehended, um, and then they would immediately be sent back to Mexico. Um, and, and that might happen multiple times. And then slowly but surely, um, the border has become increasingly... Um, 
uh, controlled and, and the penalties for attempting to cross it have become greater. And now, you know, after you cross the border a second time, the first time it's a misdemeanor, the second time it's a felony, and you might get prison time. And so that's a, you know, that's a new, it, it's, a, it's a very new phenomenon, um, you know, barely 10 years old at this point. Um, whereas the, the um, uh, offense for crossing the border um, uh, was, you know, basically administrative. It was a, it was a civil infraction um, at the misdemeanor level and people might try to come across the border 10, 15 times until they were successful. Um, and so that's just no longer the case. It doesn't work that way anymore. Um, this is a drug seizure near Nogales, Arizona. Um, the smugglers who brought this marijuana across the border were actually yelling at the border patrol agents from the border. So, um, so you know, the, the sort of space between illicit activity and enforcement activity is very, very small. It's very easy to intersect with and to see. Um, these are two smugglers. Um, uh, west or east of Nogales, um, who allowed me to make their photograph, and you can you can see they both have um, binoculars. So their you know their job is to watch for the border patrol um, while people are attempting to get um, drugs across the border, or or migrants. You know can be both. Um, these are um, uh, sunglasses and a and a belt that were taken off of a person who had crossed the border. So they became kind of a trophy for some border patrol agents. And then a, a, a breach in the fence of which there are many, the fence gets lots of holes cut in it. Um, so as soon as, as soon as fencing goes up, there's an attempt to, to defeat it. And so then um, uh, again, a project that uh, uh, Maria um, uh, Antonia told you about is the the work I did with Marcos Ramirez Ere. I talk I talk about it in, in my talk the border before. Um, so the we did a project called delimitations. And so I'm I'm interested in borders as is as, as sort of a concept, as an idea, as an abstraction, as well as the actual physicality of the border. So and that manifests in different ways in the work, right? It manifests in the the monuments project um, in 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 um, uh, sort of this kind of deep um, experience with the border space, and here it's 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 thinking about the border um, as a as a sort of historic gesture, um, but that, that but that has real consequences and that isn't static. Like we we like to think of borders as being static, but borders are actually fluid and they change over time, and our borders um, are scarcely. Um, the borders that you know, the borders that I know, European borders, American borders, um, uh, glo global borders, that you know, they're scarcely you know a few hundred years old. All of the contemporary borders that we know are a product of colonial intervention, um, and so so the idea that they are permanent and unchanging is not borne out by history. But you know, we all are burdened by our horizon of prejudice. So we like to think of them as permanent because we kind of depend on them. Um, so this project sought to, delimitations sought to trace the 1821 border between Mexico and the United States um, when Mexico was literally twice as big as it is today. Um, and you can see that boundary here. And so the, the border extends from what's today the coast of um, Oregon on the Pacific um, and then proceeds along the 42nd parallel until it gets north of the drainage um, uh, or the north of the headwaters of the Arkansas River, follows the Arkansas River drainage to the 100th meridian and then drops south from the 100th meridian to the to the Red River, Rio Rojo, um, and then along the Rio Rojo um, to a point due north of the headwaters of the River Sabine and then along the River Sabine to the Gulf of Mexico, or the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so we, um, uh, Marcos and I looked at this map um, and thought about the contemporary border and decided, and, and because this border was never marked, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a historic artifact from 1821, um, but it actually did not have any physical um, demarcation in the landscape. Um, and so in a way it becomes a kind of, it becomes a ghost, right? it's a ghost border. It's not, it's not, it's not real in people's mind. 
So we sought to um, mark this border. Um, and so we constructed, um, we constructed obelisks, which you'll see in a moment, um, and, and mark the border. But, but one of the things that we wanted to get across, this is a sort of a public installation um, uh, connected to a, a piece that we had in um, uh, Jalisco at the, an installation we did of the project at Jalisco at a, a gallery called Oficina Proyectos de Culturales. Um, uh, or, no, Oficina de, de Culturales, no, yeah, Oficina, Oficina Proyectos Culturales. Yeah, that's the right, um, OPC. Um, and so the, you know, the text is cuando para siempre duro 27 años. Um, and it's the whole idea that, um, you know, this was the border for 27 years. And the treaty texts talks about how that'll be the border forever. But it didn't, you know, that the, the didn't hold. The, the, the Mexican-American War began and the border moved south to the, to the contemporary border that we know. Um, so we built, we bought a van and we outfitted it for three guys to spend a month driving uh, through the United States. And we named ourselves the, um, the Binational Commission of Historical and Geographical Borders. Um, and, and we like to think that it's official because I commissioned Marcos and Marcos commissioned me. Um, and we set off on a trip to um, install obelisks um, that we fabricated um, along, along the route um, of the old border. Um, and so the first one we placed on um, the Pacific coast near Brookings, Oregon. Um, and the last one we placed at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and we, we covered uh, 20, 2,400 miles. So that original border was 2,400 miles. So dos mil y um, uh, cuatrocientos mias. Um, Here's an image of Marcos putting together our monuments um, uh, in the field. And then uh, a, a restaurant owner in Dodge City, Kansas, who uh, let us stay with him for the night and helped us put one of the obelisks um, on property close to the Arkansas River. And if you notice, there's a QR code on the, on the obelisk. Um, that will allow it'll take you right to the website of the of the project um so we didn't try to hide what we were doing but this was a guerrilla intervention we didn't ask for anybody's permission unless it was private land or indigenous land so we felt that um uh you know public lands were fair game for locating the obelisks but then um, uh, for tribal lands um indigenous homeland and for private land, it was trespass. So we needed to we needed to have permission because we would be sort of re recreating the colonization that we were commenting on if we just sort of planted them um, in those spaces without asking permission. This is Marcos um, uh, sort of challenging uh, the 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 border at the Red River. A little bit of play in the middle of our work. Uh, Marcos tipping up a, a monument at um, Fremont Pass in Colorado, not far from Leadville, Colorado. And I love this image because there's a sort of visual resonance, resonance with um, the Marines um, lifting the flag um, uh, at Mount Suribachi um, uh, in the um, uh, World War II in the Pacific Theater, um, that, famous, that famous image of the, of the flag being raised that Joe Rosenthal made. Um, I, I think this is sort of has a kind of similar triumphal feel to it. Um, we were very hot and very tired by the end of the trip. Um, it was we did it in the summer and it was a it was kind of an intense an intense journey. And this is a Google Google map image of our of of the where we place the obelisks. And if you go to my uh, if you go to um, uh, our Tumblr site, we had, we did a Tumblr blog. Um, you can actually download all the coordinates for these and, and see more uh, uh, with greater detail where they're located um, and, and the exact place where we put each one. Um, these are some installation shots of what that, because the, the 
the work is actually a site specific installation. So the monuments as we place them in the landscape is really the work. Um, it's probably, I, Marcos and I are pretty sure that it's the largest site specific installation that's, in, that's ever been done. Um, uh, so I think we probably hold a record. Um, but but uh, in order to make it accessible to audiences, we we um, did a museum installation. So the so the work travels as a museum installation. Um, so you can actually see, you know, what we fabricated and and where where they were located. And then we also did um, conjectural maps um, that sort of look at the territory. These two maps are called um, uh, uh, point of view, point, punta de vista. Um, and it's this idea of like, you know, just the, just the orientation, just the framing of a map, right, changes your understanding of what a territory might look like. What are the edges and boundaries of the map? How do, how do maps tell us, you know, tell us um, information and, and sort of how to scale play out um, differently because of that. And so um, uh, that was a, a sort of piece that, that dealt with that. And then we also did, we made a group of uh, pieces that are Marcos in his practice makes signs like road signs. Um, uh, um, and so we made a set of signs that are effectively roadside history signs, which are very popular in the United States. Signage that tells you about the history of a location. So the sign will tell you about this place that you've stopped. But we chose to make, usually they're somewhat, they're kind of propaganda history. You know, they, they're the they're the they're history light and they omit very important details. So we did a sign um, uh, for Fremont Pass that basically t there's a there's a, a hero, a Civil War hero, John C. Fremont, um, who was supposed to mark the headwaters of the Arkansas River for the adams onis Treaty. Um, and um, he um, he uh, basically instead of doing that work, um, uh, tried to start um, the Mexican-American War early by picking a fight with um, uh, a, a general in Monterrey, California. And so, um, uh, General Jose Castro. And so what this sign does is it basically says that Fremont was a failure, um, which is not usually what these roadside history signs do. And it also, talks about how we how he didn't actually map the headwaters of the Arkansas River. And then so it recasts us, our delimitations project, um, as the as the rightful getting the rightful credit for locating the headwaters of the Arkansas River um, in their relationship to the 42nd parallel. Um, so we completed the the boundary um, that was as it was described by the Adams Onis Treaty. Um, when Fremont failed to do so, um, uh, when he went on his, when he went on a survey and an expedition in 1847. Um, and so then uh, I have visited a couple of the locations where we placed um, markers. Um, this is one um, on the banks of the Red River. Um, and uh, uh, as you can see, it's toppled over on its side and it's been shot full of holes. And so we like to think of um, we like to think of this as a metaphor for our current debates around immigrants, immigration, and borders in the United States. It's been tipped over by it on its side, and it's it's riddled full of holes. Um, and so so hopefully, with the Biden administration in the United States, there may be important change coming. But as of right now. Um, uh, the, the posture of the United States to the entirety of the world um, is highly compromised, and the ideals that we supposedly that we espouse um, are absolutely not playing out in practice in our society. It's actually a very scary time here in the United States, um, and and we see other issues um, uh, at the at the, the you know the they're some of the most fraught issues that we're trying to deal with. Um, so, and with that, I think that is my last slide. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. I'm going to get out of screen sharing here. Um, me... All right, how do I stop okay. sharing my screen? Thank you, David. I think you have a question. Okay, ahora podemos abrir el turno de preguntas.
para aquellos que queráis hacer algunas preguntas, vale, eh, tenemos la oportunidad. Eh, creo que había hecho Macarena, creo recordar alguna pregunta. Macarena. Eh, voy, pero pregunto por audio, por escrito o como prefieres que la hagamos. Pues, como quieras, puedes hablar si quieres. Vale. Um, I'd like to ask you about if uh, crossing the border between the Mexico and the U.S. has given you any kind of trouble with the U.S. government. Because with the Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, todavía no, pero quizás en la futura, no sé. Um, uh, 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 If I'm going to have trouble, um, uh, it'll be over this detention center work because I'm sure that it, it might catch somebody's attention. I've been flying a drone over ICE detention centers. I'm operating within the law, um, but that doesn't mean that someone might not become alarmed by that. Um, uh, But in, I have, I've encountered smugglers, I've encountered Border Patrol, um, I've encountered migrants, and I've never, um, I've never had a situation develop where I have felt um, particularly threatened. I've felt nervous on a few occasions, but never threatened. So I wouldn't say I've ever had you know, trouble per se. Um, it's a space that I'm very respectful of, and I operate very carefully in it. Um, but by and large, I would say that the idea that the border is, a, is inherently a dangerous place. Now, you can find, you can find danger there. It's, you know, there is no activity. You know, there, there, there are opportunities to get yourself in trouble. But the idea that going to the border will immediately mean um, uh, you're, you're threatened, um, that is a myth that Um, the United States has done a very good job of propagating. And of course, that's the story of our border right now, that, that it's a dangerous place and that the people that come to our border are dangerous and the people that live in our border are dangerous. And I think one of the jobs of uh, uh, artists like myself and my colleagues is to, um, to, to retell the border story, um, not, to, not to obscure... Um, not to obscure uh, fraught situations, but, um, but to illuminate you know, the, what the border actually is and to retell the, to the border in a much more complicated and nuanced way. So that's, that's a long form answer to your question. Thank you. Okay, Blanca, te, tenía una pregunta. ¿Quieres activar tu micro y hacerla? Sí. Hello, David. Um, I wonder how did you pick the topics? Is it based on your own interests, like you bump into them, or is it another's? Um, that's a great question. I, I moved to the borderlands, so my, you know, the borderlands became my home in 1999. So I've lived here for 21 years now, and. The reason why I became interested in the borderlands initially was because um, in the aftermath of 9-11, the, the, you know, the attack on the World Trade Center, our national relationship to our border changed all of our borders and our relationship with other countries for that matter. Um, but it changed dramatically. And I realized that I lived within, within uh, 30 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border and I knew very little about it. And, and that prompted me to decide that I needed to be much better informed about the border. Um, and that, that resulted in my making a trip to the, to the borderline in between ports of entry. And I encountered one of those obelisks and I immediately was fascinated by it because there was nothing else. There was no fence. There was just this obelisk in the desert. And, and, uh, and, and I, I was surprised that that was that was the border. That was the whole that was the whole border. And and then after a little bit of research, I understood how many of them there were. And it seemed as though, given the amount of change that was going to be happening along the border, that that 
um, starting when I started it was which was 2006 like that this was this was the thing to do right to 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 go and re photograph these um, boundary monuments was a really important um, important uh, task because the border has changed more in the last decade than it did in the previous hundred years so that's kind of the way I think I I, I one project will sort of inform me and I'm, I will probably learn something from that project. And then um, that then perpetuates me to um, uh, follow whatever that thing I learned um, from the previous project into the next project. So making them, you know, tracing the entire land boundary between El Paso, Juarez and Tijuana San Ysidro made me think about the fact that you know, I had had this really intensive relationship with the border, and then the the idea of tracing the historic border, the border, the border before the border, m made sense. You know, it just it it felt it felt a natural progression. Great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how something can change your inside life. Uh, finally, well, um, I'm interested in photography, but I find it difficult to earn a life with it. Mm -hmm. Any recommendations? <laughs> um, well, I think that being an artist is being um, an entrepreneur. And I, I know many, many artists who um, do multiple things. Um, some are academics, um, like myself and, and Antonia. Um, but then also um, there are many artists who um, you know that have that have other types of work that that you know they write, they photograph, they um, they do production work. You know, so they they might be um, uh, doing work for um, you know in some sort of a commercial arena that uses their skills. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and I think that you know um, there's a lot of uh, there's as many answers as there are you know. Um, jobs out there. I think this is a very challenging time. I mean, you're all graduate students, as I understand it. It's a very challenging time to, to be an artist uh, because of, you know, a global pandemic and uh, the economies are in difficult spaces. I also think that what being an artist is changing, what being an artist is, is changing too, because, um, you know, I think for me more and more, the sort of participation in the quote art world. I mean, it's important. I find it very important. And I mean, it's easy for me to say this. I've had a, you know, a very, been very fortunate in that arena, but I, um, uh, I, I see, um, uh, you know, other opportunities to engage in, um, like a lot of these photographs to engage in, 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 in other sorts of aspects of what my work can do. So the photographs of the detention centers, um, they've been getting used by nonprofits um, who advocate on behalf of um, asylum seekers. So, yeah, there's like, you know, and I could imagine I have a colleague, Daniel Hernandez, who works for a nonprofit. He was a journalist um, and, uh, and, and a filmmaker, and now he works for the Florence Immigration and Refugee Rights Project and puts all of those skills as a journalist and a filmmaker to work for advocating for for migrants, for detained migrants. So, I mean, I think that that's one possible answer right there. I think ultimately the answers will be, um, if you're really passionate about your work and you are, and you have initiative, um, I think, an, you know, answers, answers become apparent to you, but it's not an easy life. I mean, being a, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot easier ways to make a living. That's for sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sal Salvatore, ¿quieres hacer una pregunta? ¿Puedes activar el micro? Sí, um, I have it. Um, okay. Uh, how is the feeling to 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 live this this empathy with the with the topic, like to live in in situ? How is the feeling to live all this with the person that are living there. 
Um, I, you dropped out, your sound dropped out for a moment, so I didn't catch part of the question. I saw, I heard empathy and how does it feel, but I didn't quite catch the rest of it. Sorry, okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear? Yeah, I can. Okay, I'll mm -hmm. use the feeling See. to, um, to like to get this um, okay always the feeling after um, be uh, so, okay I will I will um, reform the question no. okay I was the feeling um, being content like uh, be uh, in, okay I just like mix mix a lot of what give me a second. No hay problema. En español, uh, quizás, y um, uh, puedo um, tratar en español. No hay problema. Y, y um, Antonia uh, puede uh, um, Estoy aquí uh, también para uh, traducir. I think he wants to say that sí. what do you feel when you spend time uh, with people? No sé si, Salvatore, es esa más o menos tu pregunta. Um, sí, sí, exactamente. Como, um, como es su, sen su sentimiento estando tan en contacto a nivel empático eh, con, con, el, con la persona que vive y que escribe en su, en su foto, en su, en su investigación? ¿Cómo es su, su percepción comparado sí. a lo que él vive también, lo que él cuenta? Sí. sí, sí, claro, claro. Um, uh, para mí es, es un, um, I'll, I'll, en inglés, perdón, um, uh, es, um, uh, wow. e, 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 es un, um, yeah, es un, un, un situación, um, it, it's, okay, um, it's, it's complicated, um, I, I try to maintain a kind of objective distance um, because that's what documentarians are supposed to do, right? I mean, there's a sort of perception that that's what documentary work um, does. But I think, you know, as we're seeing in documentary work um, more and more that, that that's really always been kind of a, 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 a fantasy, right? That, that ultimately we bring our experiences and our understandings of the world to whatever um, situation we're engaging. Um, and so I think it's much more honest to sort of, um, uh, to sort of state your position, um, and to sort of, and, and, to operate with a kind of clearer view of, of, um, you know, what your, um, you know, what your ideas and initial influences are. Um, as how, how that plays out in terms of empathy, I think it's a really important question. I think that my relationship to that shifted enormously with this detention center work. For those of you that, um, if you read the essay that I shared, um, there's a woman um, that in the essay, Adriana, who I corresponded with, um, and I continue to correspond with um, uh, at the Eloy Detention Center, and um, and so that is a sort of subject relationship, you know, uh, uh, a documentarian relating with a subject that has turned into a personal relationship and that she's a friend. She's 24 years old. She now is in Massachusetts in the United States. She luckily got out just the day before my essay was published. And it's in the it's in the footnotes that that happened. Um, and I had the enormous honor of going and picking her up um, when she got out of detention um, and taking her to her first meal in a year and a half out of detention on the eve of her birthday um, after having eaten bologna sandwiches for a year and a half, basically, and then, and then took her to the airport the next day to fly to New York and be reunited with her sister. And so... You know, I, I think I feel over time um, that my relationship to these um, situations has become, um, you know, just in, increasingly complicated because it is a place I call home as well um, and a set of 
circumstances that I'm committed to. One of our really excellent graduate students here at the University of Arizona is from um, uh, Tijuana. Um, and so I've recruited students from Tijuana. I have collaborations and uh, collaborators and friends in Tijuana. So it's a city I travel to very frequently. So my, I'm, I occupy this very complicated space um, in that I'm always going to be an outsider to this. Um, and I'm always going to be, I'll, I'll, I'm, siempre estoy un gringo de Nueva Inglaterra, ¿sí? Um, uh, but that, that can be powerful too, right? Like I can do things that maybe other people can't do because I have that privilege. Um, and so what I try to be mindful of is that that privilege, if abused, puts me in a position of colonizing other people's experience, which is problematic. But then at the same time, that privilege used in other ways lets me fly a drone around private prisons and nobody notices me. <laughs> you know, my whiteness becomes camouflage. So I'm, I would say that's how it plays out, right? I try to be, I, I, I try to be empathetic knowing the limits of that empathy. Um, and I try to be responsible to my privilege and my work. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenging space. I don't know that I'm always su successful, but I'm, I'm thinking about it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, I I can understand that it's really hard to to separate the the different point of view. I mean, the human point of view and the camera point of view. I mean, at least you are mm -hmm. a way to uh, to communicate the the reality that they are living. I mean, I think that. Mm -hmm. It's a balance where it's a nice uh, balance, a right balance, I think. Thank you, by the way, for the Gracias. response. De nada. Okay, Maria de los Santos, tenía una pregunta también. Maria? Sí, yo. Hello, David. Um, you said that you were impressed about what the, the border was. And, I don't really know if it's really known for the people around it, but do you think that it's, it's necessary to make the border and the situation in these facilities more visible to everyone? Um, maybe your artwork, it is an opportunity to do it? I, I think it is important. There's a lot of artists paying attention to it at this point. I mean, you know, it's interesting because Back when I started doing this work in 2006, um, the border wasn't that visible in that way. And now it's in the news constantly. And there's many, many artists that have gone and done, you know, work that um, is, you know, distinctive to their to their practice. Um, I think in some ways that's why my most recent work hasn't has more abstracted the idea of borders because I could certainly go back and photograph that space more, and I'm sure that I will, um, but it has become highly, highly visible. It's in the news every single day in the United States now, whereas when I started my work, it just wasn't. You know, it was very, very sporadic coverage. I mean, it, we'd get a lot of attention, and then it would not get any attention for months. Um, and and the stories were not front page stories in the periodicals, um, but now, um, you know, I, I muchos not, noticias todos los días, you know, um, uh, yeah, because, so yeah, is that I, I yeah. have an impression because even, even here we can hear about the wall, the big new wall that um, Trump would um, build actually, uh -huh. but I have the impression that the most of people have the the idea of the wall of the border sorry but mm -hmm. really don't know what does it mean actually I, they really i don't know if i think that there are a lot of people suffering in this facility for example i think they 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 
it's weird. There's it's it's about how it's about the story density. So like if you go to the Guardian, um, you know the British publication, the Guardian, there is a lot of coverage there. If you go to the New York Times, there's a lot of coverage there. Um, that said, it's it's it gets drowned out by everything else that's going on, right? We have a pandemic, a global pandemic, the economy. I mean, oddly enough, I mean, there are moments, right? So Europe experienced a, a refugee crisis um, that's really still ongoing. I mean, the, the refugee crisis in Europe has not ended. People are still trying to cross the Mediterranean. People are still trying to get from Turkey um, into Greece. Um, uh, you know, there's there uh, the organization Frontex, which is basically the European Union's um, uh, version of the Border Patrol, um, uh, is um, a, a presence um, in Europe at this point. Um, but if we think about sort of what the national media that we see coming out of Europe here, I mean, you all may hear about the what I'm talking about more there than we do in the United States. So. Three years ago in the United States, right, everything was about Syrian refugees at, uh, um, uh, and, you know, their resettlement in France and Germany, um, Italy, right? And and a lot of the kind of right-wing uh, nationalist and nativist um, political movement we saw in Europe, you know, was very high profile um, three years ago. That sort of receded into the background with other stories, right? Brexit. Right, like there's there's other stuff that's taken up more bandwidth um, um, recently, so I think that sometimes I think it's it's it might be media saturation. It may be that the next crisis that comes along drowns out. Um, you know, there was a ton of ton of media coverage when uh, Donald Trump was um, uh, was uh, doing child separation. Um, there were child separations happening last summer. Um, which uh, the result is is that thousands of children were separated from their parents. Um, many have been reunited at this point, but there's still 500 children that are basically permanently orphaned. Um, and you know we have no idea what kind of damage was done to those kids. I mean, to be you know to be an infant and taken away from your parent and 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 you know separated for I mean what you know what kind of psychological harm. So it's it's here. I I think maybe going back to uh, uh, Salvador's uh, Salvatore's question about um, uh, you know empathy. I think sometimes we have you know we screen we screen it out. We haven't we haven't we have an empathy deficit, right? Because there's so much bad news. Um, I think that's where we have an obligation to retell the border story, right? Like we have an obligation to sort of shift public opinion so there can be good um, legislation that helps mitigate some of these problems. But yeah, I mean, I, it's, I think it's everywhere, but it's easy to miss because there's just so much media saturation. I hope that answers your question. I mean, you, you're asking something very com complex. It's a very sophisticated question. Yeah. And I don't know that there's a really good simple answer to it. Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you to you for your answer. Yeah, no problem. Okay, alguien más que quiera hacer alguna pregunta? Aprovechad ahora que tenemos aquí a David para poder lanzarle vuestras cuestiones, comentarios. Es una oportunidad. Bueno, yo mientras tanto, si nadie se lanza, voy a lanzar también una pregunta. I would like to ask you uh, if you are interested in photographing other borders. Have you in mind I, this idea? I have thought about it. I've thought about that. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, um, there's a residency in um, uh, Morocco, I think it is. So the, the, the Algerian Moroccan border, I think, is really interesting, right? Because it's actually probably the most militarized border in the world. Um, apparently, the entire thing is landmined, among other things. And so that, to me, a space that's that densely, um, you know, fortified is interesting and sort of what that looks like experiencing that. Um, I've also thought about sort of more broadly, you know, 
the idea um, in Europe, right? So the the term border comes out of um, uh, uh, comes out of uh, uh, an etymology that ties back to a term called the marchlands, and um, and so and you know border border and frontier, right? Are 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 you know they're they're effectively the same thing. Um, but then, like in English, the frontier plays out in in American English, the frontier plays out as this sort of space of promise, right? Like it's the place that we have our mythologies of independence and self-reliance in the United States. Um, whereas for, you know, in Spanish, la frontera, it's it's a demarcation. It's a line. It's a limit, right? And so I find that kind of collision interesting. So if I think about it in terms of other borders, I think about the fact that the and I think you see it in the way Europeans operate toward borders, right? That like there was this moment when European borders were very hardened, World War One to World War Two, right? When borders were being sorted out. But in the aftermath, in many ways, Europe has gone back to a relationship to borders that's more the way it had been previously, which is that you know that there the borders are definitely defined at this point, but the sort of you know, when you're in Europe traveling from one country to another, it's like you don't, when you leave, when you're in Grenoble, France, and you end up in, in Zurich, right? Like, it's different, but not really, right? Like, um, uh, and so I think that that idea of the marchlands, these sort of transition spaces, like that that's, that, that the, the really clearly defined border is, is something that is in our head, but doesn't necessarily play out. And I think Maybe Europe is a place that you could see that more clearly, but I don't know. I'd have to sort of think about it in situ there. So that's an idea that I've had, but I don't know. I don't even know how I would approach that, but it's it's definitely something that's interesting to me. If there's work there, that's a different question altogether. So. Perdona. Thank you. Eh, creo que Chiqui López eh, había, había comentado que quería preguntar y después Macarena, ¿vale? Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Me escucháis? Sí. Sí, vamos a ver. Eh, bueno, lo primero, felicitarte por el trabajo. Es cierto que es muy difícil no hacer un... Perdón que esté hablando en español... Eh, Creo que me, me entiendes, así tienes una oportun oportunidad para practicar tu maravilloso español, que es un gusto escucharte hablando en él. ¿Me entiendes? Um, uh, entiende un parte, pero no todo. Perdón, lo siento. Perfecto, hablo despacio. Eh, lo primero, eh, felicitarte por el trabajo. Eh, y efectivamente, creo que, creo que es muy difícil no hacer un paralelismo entre entre la frontera eh, con México, eh, de Estados Unidos con México, y nuestra frontera eh, con, con el sur, con el norte de, de África, con, con el continente africano. Eh, eh, la, la verdad es que me interesa mucho y me encanta que hayas eh, tomado esta decisión de, de trabajar sobre las, las fronteras históricas de Estados Unidos, algo bastante desconocido. Ah, gracias. Pero ah, eran varias preguntas. Una era si habías tenido algún problema, porque es muy conocido el nacionalismo eh, del, del, del América de, para los americanos, que empieza con Monroe, ¿no? Eh, con la población cuando te han visto trabajando eh, y colocando esos, esos eh, monolitos eh, eh, en la antigua frontera. ¿Has tenido problemas con la población local mm -hmm. o has necesitado permisos para establecerlos? Ah, sí, claro. Um, uh, and, uh, is this um, un pregunta porque um, uh, uh, entiendo um, mucho, pero um, uh, es tu pregunta sobre um, la frontera antigua o la frontera contemporánea? It's yes to know if you have uh, some problems with uh, with uh, with the uh, local population when you try to, to sí, when sí. they put the 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 the, the monuments uh, in the in the old frontier sí, of uh, sí. 
of uh, see, of see, see, that's what I thought you were asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 see, I did, I did understand. Okay, N no, um, uh, it, surprisingly, um, people were very accommodating. Um, so um, people were very, very accommodating. They were fascinated by the by the idea. Um, and when we did ask permission, people people granted it to us readily because they were quite surprised um, to learn that the border was that far north. Um, and then the ones we placed on public land, we didn't ask permission. So whether anybody had a problem with it, we wouldn't know. Um, but you know, people could have tracked us down because we put the QR code on the monument, um, uh, and it takes you right to our Tumblr page. So if some public official had been upset with us, um, they would have been able to get a hold of us without any trouble at all. Um, we didn't try to hide um, what we were doing. Um, so yeah, so it was it was it was not a difficulty. It was actually quite. Um, it was it it generated uh, excellent conversation. Um, uh, the conversations we had with people as we did the work were fantastic. So thanks for I actually got like almost all of your question, I was just like, I could, I, I, I no sé que um, hablaremos uh, de la frontera antigua o, o contemporáneo. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. And, and the last question, uh, the two things. Uh, the first is, uh, uh, and the last times in the, before one, uh, 1828, uh, 1080, mm -hmm. um, you know, when the when the the country passed to the American hands. Uh, I don't know if you know Thank that uh, it was a um, a hard um, tem uh, temptation to to imp to impose to impose uh, the 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 Hispanic culture to the immigrants to the American immigrants in in Texas. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it was so cu curious for me to to know that when I when I read about that, you know, they they have to mm -hmm. change their names and they put they have to put uh, Spanish names and uh, for example, if you if you are if you are John, you have to uh, change your name to Juan to try to to uh, create a, a Spanish culture in the in the area. Mm -hmm. And and another right. thing is, uh, and you you have to you have to know about uh, talking about this uh, question of uh, uh, cu different cultures in in different uh, territories. For example, in Marrakesh, in Maroc, in Marrakesh, in Maroc, uh, mm -hmm. you can find uh, a cromlech in Emsora is the name Emsora. I can write now if you want. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's easy to, to make a parallelism between your your um, elements high, high elements with this uh, uh, menir menires uh, in Emsora, uh, and it's mm -hmm. so curious to see how the how the pe how people from the north of Europe was uh, Celtics was in in Morocco and on the on the past, you know, and, and uh, mm -hmm. it's it's so curious to see. How, how uh, we, we we live in this uh, mix uh, of uh, of cultures? No, we are over that uh, mm -hmm. layers of uh, different cultures over the time. Yeah, yeah, but then but then nativism still you know asserts itself, right? So like we have you know we have uh, far right wing movements you know in France that try to rear their head and in mm -hmm. Poland, right? Like so there's. It's it's a uh, it's always a project in process, right? Mm -hmm. It seemed it seemed that the sort of more um, liberal Enlightenment ideals would hold in Europe in the aftermath of the Cold War, um, but but we see you know we see um, uh, uh, nativist and uh, nationalistic and and even fascist um, uh, impulses manifest because people are afraid of immigration, right? So it's like, you know, and Brexit, Brexit is all about immigration, right? I mean, like Brexit basically shot itself in the foot economically over immigration, right? They wanted to be able to control their borders. Um, and it really, you know, a nativist argument really affected that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated about how 
these things play out in in various you know in various spaces. But yeah, I, I, your comments are really insightful and interesting. It makes me feel like I need to learn even more. So thank you so much and congratulations for your work. Thank you. Mucho gusto. Gracias. Okay, no sé si había levantado antes la mano alguien más. Creo recordar, no sé si había sido Macarena. <risa> vale, pues puedes hablar, Macarena, cuando quieras. Vale. Uh, my question was related to, to María Antonia. Uh, I would like to know if you have any, any future projects in mind and also to tell you that I love your work. Oh, thank you very much. Um, muchas gracias. Um, uh, so the work that I will be work uh, that I'll be doing right now is is really finishing up the detention center project, uh, and then also continuing. If you read my essay, um, I haven't formulated any of the images from Guerrero or um, the the um, refugee crisis as it unfolded in Tijuana. Those haven't been brought into kind of an exhibition form, except for one one show that's in um, uh, Guadalajara right now. So yeah, I'm I'm at the point where the work has a kind you know has a has a resolve to it, and I understand what it is, but I haven't produced it into exhibitions. And then beyond that, I have not I have not thought that far yet. I have to I need I will start thinking about what comes next. But I probably have a you know a good couple of years in making this work um, uh, operate in physical space, right? Looking for venues for the work here in the United States and in Mexico and, you know, potentially, you know, uh, uh, Europe. I mean, there's there's publications in Europe that I'd be interested in working with. So, yeah, that's that's where I'm at at this point. I'm, I've, I've got the, I have the imagery, I have the audio. The other thing, uh, the other answer to that question might be, that there's a part of the detention center work, the prison work, um, uh, that comes out of the interviews that we've been conducting um, with uh, refugees. So there's way more audio that I have that can ever be um, uh, used in a video installation. Um, and so we realized, the people that are, I'm conducting the interviews with realized that this is really important material. I mean, it's people reliving their trauma um, uh, and sharing the long form version of their story uh, of being incarcerated, why they fled their country, what their circumstance is now after they've been released from incarceration. Um, they're, they're, they represent a fleeting population. They're in those prisons for a period of time and they might Managed to get asylum here in the United States, or more likely, are deported, and and it it's evident to us that that's a that's a a transient history. It's a history that's fleeting. It's a history that'll cease to exist unless someone decides to pay attention to it. So we're beginning an archive project, and we're looking for funding for it. An archive project to to really amass and collect these interviews um, uh, with more with the idea of gathering a lot of them, as many as we can. Um, and to have that be a sort of an archive in the way uh, archives function in the visual arts, which is, you know, in an artistic practice, which is sort of archive as art object, um, that the that this collected um, accounts of these people become a monument to their experience, right? And, and, and sort of memorialize um, their experience and trauma in these detention centers, but then simultaneously to have it function as uh, a practical archive, you know, in accord with the way the best standards and practice for running an archive um, operate. And, and so then it would become a repository of materials that journalists and artists, um, writers um, uh, could, could access to make other projects descendant from archival material. So, so thinking about, you know, archive, you know, in the way that somebody like Ilya Kabakov or Christian Boltansky or Teresa Margoyes or, you know, um, Ronnie Horn, right? Like artists that, you know, that use the archive um, in their work, that, that, it, that, it, that it can be seen as that, but it also can be seen as, as 
you know, the practical archive that, you know, archivists manage. So I think that's another aspect of where the work is going. And so we're all, I'm working with a, uh, a border historian, my, my friend and colleague, um, Anita Huizar Hernandez, um, uh, and my colleague, uh, Francisco Cantu, um, and then another, who he's a writer, and then another writer, um, Susan Briante. All of us are border specialists, and so we're working at sort of coalescing this effort around um, constructing this archive. So that's something that, you know, it's it's a total outgrowth of the current work and, and has the potential to be much bigger. Um, but I haven't seen any further ahead than that. That's that's where I am at this point. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. OK, alguien más que quiera intervenir? Nadie? Bueno, eh, quiero comentaros también la actividad que vamos a desarrollar el día 1 de febrero con David Taylor, ¿vale? El workshop. Eh, hablaros un poquito de en qué va a consistir, sobre todo para que vayamos trabajando en él, ¿vale? Eh, bueno, pues el workshop va a consistir en una discusión, en un, en un debate que vamos a establecer eh, durante una hora aproximadamente en torno a cómo entendemos el tiempo y el territorio en tiempos de pandemia, ¿no? Cada uno de nosotros, más o menos esa es la idea, ¿no? Eh, a mí también me gustaría que si David quiere exponer algunas ideas, eh, quiere explicar un poquito. Would you like to explain eh, about the workshop, David? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I think that um, it could be interesting and, you know, I'm, I'm interested in feedback about this. I'm sort of been negotiating these problems with my own students, right? What is you know, how do we understand place um, in this moment, right? Where we're all, um, we're all disconnected um, at the same time that we're more connected than we've ever been before. And sort of what constitutes place? How do we understand territory? How are we negotiating place um, at this moment of dislocation? Um, and um, uh, at this moment where um, our, you know, our communication is facilitated like it's never been before, but at the same time, there's this great sense of isolation um, and disconnection that we feel. And so I'm interested in, in us uh, taking an opportunity to sort of reconsider um, sort of how we think about place given all of that, given our collective experiences of the last year. And so that could involve writing, it could involve video, it could involve photography, it could, you know, it might mean um, uh, attending to your interior space where you are immediately, um, but it might it might entail thinking about in what ways um, you might push back against that. Like how do you how do you think about place um, outside your immediate personal space, and how have you been accessing it in this moment? Um, and I can fold it back directly to my you know this is maybe the, a, a sort of extreme example, but um, I. Uh, I, when I photographed all of the detention centers, I um, did it during the pandemic and, and initially the university had shut down travel. I mean, I did it actually without the permission of the university, um, even though I let my director know. Um, and, and I quarantined uh, before I left and then my truck became like my, my living, you know, I didn't interact with people. So I was traveling all over the Western United States and not interacting with people and I was still using you know, using my phone um, as my primary, um, you know, my primary contact with, with the world. And so it was like being this strange bubble, right, where I'm going to all of these sites and traveling all this territory. And it was like an, uh, uh, it was like a, an episode of the Twilight Zone, right, because there weren't that many people out at that point. Um, and it just made me really reconsider like, how we move through space and sort of what we you know, sort of how we map our space given the nature of our human relationships and how new communication platforms have sort of altered that. And, and I feel like a lot of that has come, come into high relief. So that's, I'm sort of interested in people um, grappling with those questions, right? As I think that it's, it feels, um, I think of it as something very sort of appropriate to the moment, right? That, that I, I deal with territory and space and place in my work um, and place, 
for, I don't know, to, to maybe parse out one aspect of that, um, you know, place is a, is, is a, is a, um, you know, a, a loaded word, um, as differentiated by, um, from space, there's a, a, a geographer, Yi Fu Tuan, that writes about this a lot. And basically, uh, you know, distilled to his essence, um, space is undifferentiated territory, but place is territory with history. Um, and so our history around, you know, all different manifestations of, of um, uh, the places that we habituate has changed enormously. So how do we, you know, how do we think about that now? How do we access that now? Um, what does it look like? What, you know, what, what um, is our relationship to it? So that's, that's the idea. So any questions that you all have re related to that? And I, I think of things like this as a, you know, I want you to teach me in a, in a workshop setting. So if that's a good enough prompt um, to sort of get a conversation going and get some, um, some people working in various directions, I'll be, I'll be interested to know. Um, I've been thinking about it in terms of everything, you know, the way we consume, right? Like how the nature of, you know, in the United States, we have people get their groceries delivered now. Um, uh, we don't go to cafes right now. I mean, dating for people has changed enormously. Like what, you know, how do you date somebody at this point in time in the middle of the pandemic? Like, what does that even look like? Right. Um, uh, just, you know, what, like how much solitude we, we deal with. So yeah, those are, those are the things that are going through my head. Okay, thank you. Todos más o menos tenéis claro la idea? Es un va a ser un ejercicio básicamente de reflexión, un feedback, ¿vale? Entre todos para poder tratar el tema sobre todo en una circunstancia tan complicada como la que estamos viviendo. ¿Alguien más quiere hacer algún comentario, tiene alguna duda, alguna pregunta de última hora? ¿Nadie? Bueno, pues si no hay nada más que añadir, eh, muchas gracias, David. Eh, thank you so much for this fantastic lecture. Eh, I, creo que claro. todos, todos hemos disfrutado eh, muchísimo. Así gracias. que muchas gracias. Vale. Eh, agradecemos también, bueno, pues que hayas también hablado un poco en español. O sea, el inglés es muy claro igualmente, así que bueno, pues ha sido un placer. Creo que por Gracias. aquí han preguntado algo. Bueno, no hay que preparar Mucho... ningún material concreto, María, que has, pre has preguntado. Eh, de todas formas, lo comentamos ahora en la clase de metodologías, ¿vale? Que la tenemos enseguida también. Okay. ¿Vale? Ok. Pues eh, si no hay nada más, eh, pues esto es todo. Eh, muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias. Mucho gusto conocerlos. Mucho gusto. Gracias a ti. Hasta uh -huh. pronto. Hasta pronto. Hasta en dos semanas. Ok. Ok. Adiós. Hasta luego.